So good afternoon. Um, I am Joan Benz, the Program and Administrative Coordinator for Sharp Again Naturally. Uh, and I want to welcome you to today's Stay Sharp webinar, the APOE4 gene, uh, what it tells us and what we can learn from it. One second. Uh, we would like to note that the information in this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Our information is intended to empower individuals and their families and healthcare professionals who want to collaborate in the most effective ways on this journey to health and well being. Please see a licensed and qualified medical professional for your med medical needs. So before we begin, I would like to um, share a short programming update. If you could advance that slide. Uh, our final webinar of 2022 is open for registration. Better Detox equals Better Brain. And that will be on Wednesday, November 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, as um, soon as we have our 2023 webinar and Stay Sharp coaching program schedules, are, uh, we will share those date with, dates with you okay. via yeah. email and social media, of course. Um, oh, one second. Uh, and so I would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for our APOE4 Gene Webinar. I'd like to welcome and introduce our speaker, Dr. Corinne Spencer. Um, you want to slide that? Um, Dr. Spencer was inspired as a teenager to become a neuroscientist when her grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Spencer went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and double majored in chemistry and cellular and molecular biology. She then went to the University of Pennsylvania where she earned a PhD in pharmacological sciences. After 30 years spent in academic research studying the molecular mechanisms of stress, learning and memory and autism, Dr. Spencer left a genetics faculty position at Baylor College in 2016 with a dream to br help bridge the gap between Alzheimer's research and real life solutions. Inspired by research, recent research highlighting lifestyle interventions and as effective in reversing dementia, she desires to bring practical information and hope to people who live with a family legacy of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Spencer, you have the floor. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Um, this, this is Dr. James Watson. So he is the father of DNA. Um, he discovered the structure of DNA along with Francis Crick and Rosalind Franklin in, in 1953, and he won a Nobel Prize for it. Um, in 2007, I was employed at Baylor College of Medicine, and my department, the genetics department, was involved in a million dollar project to sequence his entire personal genome. Um, it took two months, and they presented it to him on a DVD in a ceremony at Baylor, and I had the pleasure of being there. So um, one thing I thought was very interesting was that uh, you know, out of his entire genome, 3 billion bases, 24,000 genes, there was one gene he did not want to know about. And I'm sure you can guess, because it's the topic of today's seminar, um, that was APOE4. Um, So um, he had a, um, a grandmother who had died of with Alzheimer's in her 80s and he was um, approaching 80. And so um, he didn't want to know about it because at the time, you know, it was thought that there was nothing that could be done about it. Now, this, is, this was way back in 2007. So we know a lot more about APOE4 and we know more about Alzheimer's disease. Um, you may have heard this, this saying 
that your genes are not your destiny. So um, now it's not always true, but for ApoE4, it actually is true, as you'll see. So if, if ApoE4 is not your destiny, why do DNA testing? Um, now, I think that even if they are not predicting the future, that genes can be useful information. So my intention today is, is not to convince you to go out and get DNA testing to discover your ApoE4 status. Um, but I found this information helpful for myself. And I, I, um, I wanna share why and how it's been useful for me. So today, uh, what you'll learn about is um, the connection between ApoE4 and Alzheimer's risk, how ApoE4 contributes to Alzheimer's, the benefits of knowing your ApoE4 status. I'll share three ApoE4 inspired lifestyle recommendations and uh, we'll discuss DNA testing considerations. So um, over 6 million people in America are living with Alzheimer's currently. Um, and the two biggest risk factors for Alzheimer's are age and genetics. Um, these are two risk factors that you really can't control. So for age, um, it's known that one in nine people over age 65 have Alzheimer's. Um, and then this rate increases to one in three people over age 85. So it's understood that the risk is doubling about every five years after the age of 65. Now for genetics, I, um, I want to um, make sure you understand that there is a genetic form of Alzheimer's. It's um, called early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's very rare, so less than 1% of all Alzheimer's cases are this, this variety. Um, people get this bef before age 60, um, and it involves um, one of three genes um, that are rare again, um, but fully penetrant. So presenilin-1, presenilin-2, and amyloid precursor protein. But today we're really discussing what's called late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And for this, uh, ApoE4 is the biggest genetic risk factor. And it, it creates about a three to 12 fold risk. Okay, so um, I'd like to speak about what's called genetic penetrance, just so it, it kind of, I think, really brings home the idea of, of um, uh, that ApoE4 is a little different than, um, than a strictly genetic disorder. So genetic penetrance is referring to the proportion of people who carry a specific gene variant or mutation that actually express that trait or the condition associated with that gene. So full or complete penetrance means that virtually everyone who carries the gene mutation gets the condition. And really this term is used with deterministic genes where the data is showing that the, the gene variant directly causes the mutation. So um, examples of fully penetrant genetic conditions are the early onset familial Alzheimer's um, and Huntington's disease. So you know, 99 plus percent of people who have uh, a genetic mutation associated with these diseases um, are predicted to get the disease. Um, actually, I think it was interesting just this year, there was, a, there was a, a, a case study reported of a person who had a mutation in um, a familial Alzheimer's mutation um, who did not get it. Um, and they dis discovered that she had a mutation in another gene um, that they think protected her from it. And so they're, they're trying to figure out how that all worked. So, Basically, ApoE4 has not been shown to directly cause Alzheimer's. So it's really not deterministic. And it's, so therefore it's called a risk gene. Um, okay.
So late onset Alzheimer's disease is um, typically characterized by the signs of dementia occurring after age 65. So 90 to 95% of all Alzheimer's is late onset, but um, it's been seen that there's an increasing rate of non-familial Alzheimer's before age 65. So it's early onset, but it's not familial. And so far over 60 um, sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's disease associated genes have been identified. Now ApoE4 was discovered in 1993. So like almost 30 years ago. And um, it, it was and remains the biggest genetic risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease. It's found in about 40% of all Alzheimer's disease patients, but this varies worldwide and it is not 100% penetrant. So um, not everybody in, with Alzheimer's has AP, APO4. Um, so you'll see that it varies across the world. Um, it's, it's more common to find the gene in, um, in Alzheimer's patients in North America and Europe, um, less common in Asia or Nigeria. So this points to other factors contributing to Alzheimer's. And you've probably heard that lifestyle factors also contribute to development of Alzheimer's. So um, studies have shown that in some groups of people in the US that um, APOE status is not limited, linked at all to Alzheimer's. So the African Americans, Hispanic Americans and Native Americans actually show little to no link between APOE4 status and Alzheimer's. So these groups do exhibit a high rate of Alzheimer's um, as well as a high rate of some of the lifestyle factors associated with Alzheimer's, like uh, diabetes and obesity. So let's look at APOE4 a little closer. So APOE4 is actually um, better described as a gene variant. So there are three common variants of APOE gene, APOE2, APOE3, APOE4. Uh, you get one copy of a gene from your mother and one copy of the gene from your father. So that means that there are six possible genotypes. Okay, if you have just one copy of APOE4, um, then that is equivalent to a two to three fold risk of Alzheimer's. Two copies of APOE4 are connected to a nine to 12 fold risk of Alzheimer's. Now, approximately 15 to 20% of Americans have at least one copy of APOE4. And um, it's, it's more rare to have two copies with only two to 3% of Americans having two copies. Okay, so not everyone with APOE4 gets Alzheimer's, right? So what I'd like you to focus on here is first of all, People who don't have APOE4 also get Alzheimer's. Um, if you look at the, but as you get more copies, so with one copy of APOE4, you have two to three fold more incidence of Alzheimer's. With two copies of APOE4 or homozygous, you get even more. Um, now the numbers, I don't want you to focus on the numbers because they keep revising these. Um, as more and more people get genotyped. Um, and that's part of it. The, the, APO, the, the, the homozygous condition is so unusual that that in particular is, um, is not been a very accurate number. And um, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, so um, it actually was revised in 2007 um, or 17 to um, 31 to 40% lifetime risk for, for uh, homozygous E4, E4. So those numbers are going down, which indicates that, that um, it really is not penetrant, very penetrant at all. I mean, when I first saw this number 91%, I thought like, wow, that's pretty high. Um, but what we're seeing is that it's not as high as that. And, um, and I think as um, more and more people 
realize the connection with lifestyle factors that we'll see that number go down even more. Okay, so it's not, it's not just genetics, right? Um, so how does it, and we know that lifestyle connects to um, Alzheimer's risk. So how does it compare? So, right, I said that one, one copy of APOE4 leads to a two to three fold increased risk of Alzheimer's. Um, what other lifestyle factors have a similar rate of increased risk for Alzheimer's? And there's a lot of them. Diabetes, obesity, chronic insomnia, lifelong onset depression or late life onset depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, having two or more bouts of head injuries, heavy sm smoking and heavy drinking. Um, so many of these are in our control and I'll be coming back to lifestyle factors later in the talk. Um, now this was, this was relative to one copy of APOI4. And to be honest, there, there are no known lifestyle risk factors greater than having two copies of APOI4. So let's take a closer look at this gene, APOE4. APOE4 is a gene variant of, a, of the APOE gene. Um, the gene encodes instructions for making apolipoprotein E. So apolipoproteins are, are proteins that bind and transport fats. Um, fats are, include cholesterol, lipids, fatty, omega-3 fatty acids. And they also transport things that are carried along with the fat, such as fat soluble vitamins and toxins. Apolipoproteins are components of lipoproteins, such as LDL, HDL, VLDL. Now you've probably heard of some of those if you've uh, had your cholesterol tested. Now there are six major subtypes of, of apolipoproteins, A, B, C, D, E, and H. There's several minor subtypes and sub-subtypes. Um, <laughs> so it's a big family. Um, and APOE is the major apolipoprotein found in the brain. And there are three common gene variants, APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. Okay, the, the, the three gene variants arise due to um, single nucleotide changes in the gene. So um, the APOE3 is the, um, is the normal gene and a single ba base mutation, single nucleotide mutation gives rise to APOE4 and a different single nucleotide mutation gives rise to APOE2. Now, when the DNA is, um, is translated into RNA and then translated into protein, these, um, these mutations result in three different protein isoforms. So the, pro the protein is made up of a string of amino acids and the, um, um, there are 21 amino acids and um, each amino acid, it has a, um, a DNA code um, and so the single, the single base nucleotide change here has resulted in a different amino acid being substituted than the original. So for the APOE gene proteins, there are, um, there are two locations where these differences are occurring. Okay. So uh, when you have a long string of, of, of amino acids and all those different amino acids interact with each other differently, so a change in amino acid will um, alter the, what's called the secondary structure. So the interaction of all the amino acids causes the protein to kind of bend and fold and twist, turns on itself. It forms a secondary structure that, um, that influences how the protein func functions. So these changes that are occurring for the APOE protein are altering its functions. And um, the protein has um, um, three major functions, and that is to bind fats or lipids, 
to bind re receptors and to bind metals. And this is just a little example, kind of a schematic showing um, how the how kind of like the interaction of the different amino acids kind of results in slightly different um, co conformation in the protein uh, leading to a change. So in this case, the um, basically the change means that ApoE2 and ApoE3 can bind HDL, but ApoE4 due to a different conformation does not bind HDL as well. It prefers to bind VLDL. Um, which is actually a, a bad kind of cholesterol. Um, <laughs> it's a bad form versus HDL, which is a good form. Hope that wasn't too sciencey. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> in the brain, um, ApoE proteins are made by all, all the brain cell types, um, neurons, astrocytes, and glial cells. It's made um, mainly by the astrocytes though. Um, ApoE will transport the fats and lipids into the brain out and into cells and out. Um, it binds metals and transports them. And ApoE also regulates beta amyloid metabolism, aggregation, and clearance. Um, it, with ApoE4, the function is altered and it is um, linked to the Alzheimer's disease process. So um, the hallmark signs of Alzheimer's are um, beta amyloid plaques, neurofibrillary tangles um, composed of phospho tau, um, and um, signs of inflammation, which was just kind of recently added uh, in, as a sign of Alzheimer's in the brain. Um, because what, was, what they've discovered is that there were plenty of people who had plaques and tangles in their brain, but were cognitively normal. Well, they didn't have Alzheimer's disease. Um, they didn't express Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's been a new one too. And what's been interesting to discover is that actually ApoE4 contributes to all of these features of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, now there's been 30 years of research on, on how ApoE4 contributes to um, mechanisms associated with Alzheimer's. So I can't possibly cover everything um, in, um, in the time we have. So I'd like to highlight some of the features of, of ApoE4 biology um, based on um, and in the context of my own experience as an ApoE4 carrier. So I was introduced to Alzheimer's when my grandmother was diagnosed and that was over 40 years ago now. Um, this is my grandmother, Iola. And um, later two of her sisters also were diagnosed. Um, and so there's this very strong family link. Now the experience of course had a very significant influence on me um, such that I became a molecular neuroscientist. Now about nine years ago now, um, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. And um, being, a, 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 being a neuroscientist with this family history, I was aware that that meant my brain was already starting to look like an Alzheimer's brain. So it really shook me up. And um, after I reversed the prediabetes with lifestyle changes within a year, um, you know, my risk for Alzheimer's was still at the forefront of my mind. And so I wanted to know if I had the ApoE4 variant. So I did the test. Um, in this case, I did the, uh, I, I bought a, ki a kit from 23andMe. I spit in the tube and I sent it off and I discovered that I have one copy of ApoE4. So what does it mean to have the ApoE4 gene. The first thing to keep in mind that for ApoE4, genes are not destiny. Okay, the next is to consider what, how knowing this could affect your life. So here's what we know that can influence whether you develop Alzheimer's. There are things you can't change, like age, your family history, um, your past experiences, for instance, if you've had a traumatic brain injury um, in the past, 
uh, you can't change your genes and you cannot change your APOE4 status. It is what it is. Um, but you can change um, lifestyle factors. And there are many recommendations for preventing, uh, reversing, uh, delaying Alzheimer's these days. They include uh, nutrition, exercise, sleep, managing stress, managing chronic conditions, getting mental and social stimulation, and avoiding toxins. Um, and you can also change your mindset. So sometimes these recommendations can feel like a lot. It is, it's a long list. It's a lot to keep in mind and, and have to do. So what I found is that having APOE4 has helped me, for one thing, for one, keep serious about it you know, like, um, and to do the things. And also it's helped me to, to prioritize um, the different parts of it. So I'd like to share with you three ways that having APOE4 has inspired and influenced my lifestyle decisions. Uh, they revolve around how APOE4 affects beta amyloid, how it affects the uh, fat, fat metabolism and toxic exposure. So first off, um, for amyloid, um, so APOE4 influences beta amyloid at multiple levels, right? It, so it increases beta amyloid production as part of the inflammatory response. It increases beta amyloid aggregation, makes it clump together, leading to plaque formation. And it decreases beta amyloid clearance out of the brain. There are mechanisms that will naturally do this. Um, and APOE4 decreases that. So what to do about that? So for me, I, I focus on minimizing inflammation. And so that um, has meant a more, like, a more Mediterranean style or, or um, mind diet, uh, low in sugar and processed foods, managing stress and minimizing infections and toxins. Um, it also means increasing my natural brain detoxification process. And, and that means getting quality restorative sleep because during deep sleep, the glymphatic system is active and cellular waste, which includes beta amyloid, gets flushed out of the brain. So for fats, um, I learned that the APOE4 binds and transports fats less efficiently. And that sometimes the, the, chem, like the chemical version of the fat matters. So for instance, um, uh, the omega-3 fatty acid DHA um, can come as, um, as a free form, like it comes in, in fish oil supplements uh, versus phosphatidylcholine DHA. Um, and that is present in fish. Um, so APOE4 is not able to transport free DHA across the brain, brain, blood brain barrier, but it is able to transport phosphatidylcholine. Um, other things to keep in mind is that the brain is 60% fat and that cholesterol and lipids are absolutely essential for normal brain function, um, including memory formation. So to form memories, you have to, you know, you have to remodel the, the neuronal connections and the pathways. And that takes a, a lot of lipids um, for, the, for memory remodeling and, and, um, and recycling the neurons and, and repairing the neurons. And APOE4 is just not as efficient at supplying the neurons with the needed cholesterol and lipids. Now, another thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind is that um, APOE4 also increases cardiovascular disease risk um, by about 40%. Now, I keep this um, in perspective compared to the Alzheimer's risk, which is 200 to 300 times um, th percent risk. So um, often in my mind, maybe because I don't have as much of a uh, other cardiovascular risk factors that um, I, I, I kind of think that 
that the, the Alzheimer's risk outweighs the uh, cardiovascular risk. And so um, kind of with that in mind, I, I approach things maybe a little differently than somebody who had cardiovascular risk might. Um, so for me, I, I look to consume more high quality, healthy fats. So things like nuts and seeds and avocado. Um, I eat more fish um, versus just taking fish oil supplements. And that's because the fish pr provide the phosphatidylcholine DHA, the form of DHA that ApoE4 before it can tran transport across the blood brain barrier. And I do keep an eye on my cholesterol numbers, um, especially uh, when, I, when I initially changed my diet for, um, for, for uh, prediabetes prevention. I, um, I went low carb, which meant that it was kind of natural to, to increase fats. And so, um, I, I did um, see an increase in cholesterol, mild increase, not very high. Um, now, a lot of people who have APOE4 are kind of warned against um, going on a higher fat diet. Um, I think that it may be, this is actually true for some people, um, but the nice thing about cholesterol is that you can test it, you can see. So for me, my, um, my cholesterol did not go that much higher. It did go up a little bit, but also my HDL went up. Um, and if your LDL does go up, you can get an exp expanded lipid profile, um, uh, which I did. And I found out that my slightly increased LDL actually um, was, major was in the majority of having the the um, light and fluffy kind of LDL as, as opposed to the arthroscopic kind of LDL. Okay, so for toxins, um, this was this part was really new to me. I, uh, I, toxins were really not on my radar um, until I learned this about APOE4. So um, APOE4 binds metals and transports them. But its function is compromised due to the to to uh, the amino acids that are um, unique to it as opposed to ApoE3 or four or two. So ApoE4 is unable to bind divalent mercury as efficiently as a A3 or E2. And mercury is a known neurotoxin. Okay? It's it it's been known to cause what's called Mad Hatter syndrome. So I think this was in industrial England. Uh, when they were making hats, they used mercury in the process. And um, what ended up happening is many of the people who worked in the factories would go mad. Um, you know, basically they had dementia. And it was tracked back to mercury. So, and there are many studies that show that APOE4 carriers are more susceptible to the neurotoxic effects of mercury, lead, and cadmium. And you know, my guess is other metals as well. So what are the actions here? So um, I switched to eating more organic produce and also organic pasture-raised animal products. Um, you know, many toxins are fat soluble. They get carried in fat tissue. So I think that, that it really made sense to upgrade the quality of the animal products I was consuming. Um, I also do what I can to avoid or limit heavy metal neurotoxin exposure, especially mercury. So um, I stay away from, from uh, tuna and other large mouth fish um, and eat more what's called smash fish. So smash uh, stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Um, these fish have smaller mouths or, or very small so they and don't live as long. So they don't tend to accumulate uh, toxic metals to the extent that other um, large mouth fish do. Um, I'm also mindful about my amalgam fillings. I have a few. And so um, I'm, I, I've decided to, to keep mine for now um, because you can get a very large exposure if you have them removed. Um, and I mean, I might, if I had two copies of APOE4, I might think about removing them by, with a, uh, the help of a biological dentist. Um, but for now I'm keeping mine, but I keep in mind that if, 
if it, it becomes damaged and needs to be um, removed, that I probably will seek the help of a biological dentist. I also do things like enhance to enhance the elimination of heavy metals by by um, doing sauna, and um, it's kind of a nice thing. And and there are me there are metals that are eliminated through sweat that aren't um, as if efficiently eliminated through any other route of detoxification in your body. Um, yeah. So so in hearing about your next seminar, it's like. Um, I think that that's great. I, I, I will actually sign up for that seminar and learn more about detoxing because I think that this is a big deal for, for people who have APOE4. Okay, so my, um, my APOE3, APOE4 lifestyle. Um, it keeps me inspired to um, learn, keep learning about APOE4 and Alzheimer's prevention. And it keeps me honest about my current health practices. You know, I don't like to exercise, but you know, I keep in mind like, oh, you know, I'm at risk for Alzheimer's. I, you know, I need to exercise. Um, or like if I am uh, tempted to eat um, sweets, you know, I might think about this. You know, I don't want to slip back into getting um, prediabetes again or, or having, it, having it progress to diabetes. It really motivates me to continue to up-level my health practices, especially those connected to APOE4. Um, uh, and it inspires me to live my best life now, not to wait, right? Um, because it's possible. It's possible I might get Alzheimer's. So um, I'm gonna do all I can and um, I'm not gonna wait for uh, a magic pill. I am going to, um, and I'm going to live my best life now. So when it comes to testing versus not testing, um, what are the considerations? So first of all, uh, you know, ask yourself: Do you really want? Do I really want to know? And you know, are you prepared for any outcome? You know, what would it be like to learn that you have zero, one, or two copies of APOE4? Um, have you thought about the implications for family members? You know, because if you, if you, um, if you know your status, you have an idea of what the status is for your family members. Um, you know, for instance, if you had two copies, then you know probably most of your family members have it. Or the implications could be, say, you and your sister both get tested, and one of you has APOE four and one doesn't. What does that mean? Um, okay, so do you understand also what is meant for, by genes are not destiny when it comes to APOE4? Do you understand that lifestyle practices can influence your risk of developing Alzheimer's? And would it be empowering to know of your genetic vulnerabilities? Would you take action if you knew you had one or two copies of APOE4? Or would you feel disempowered? And I really encourage you to be honest with yourself. Um, because um, you can't change your, your, your gene status. And you also can't go back if once you learn your gene status. So, um, you know, take some time to really think about um, how you would feel about it. Okay, so if you want to do this, um, the, the two most popular DNA tests are 23andMe and Ancestry DNA. I've done both. Um, 23andMe has a, um, and they're both about $99 to get your the, the basic test. Um, and 23andMe has an easy add-on health report option where you can find out your APOE status. Um, I think it's about $100 more. Whereas um, Ancestry DNA, you need a third-party DNA analysis to find out your status. Um, and that's because what well, ancestry for a brief period of time was, was creating a health report, but I see that they're not doing that anymore. So I don't know what happened with that. Um, but their emphasis is really on ancestry, um, versus the 23andMe, they're really focused on health research. Now, there are some privacy concerns that people have about 23andMe. Um, they will sell your data, although, um, I think you can opt out. Um, I know I was able to opt out and I just don't know if it's 
uh, current option. Um, you know, they they collaborate with um, some big pharmaceutical companies um, and sell their data. Uh, interestingly, the Ancestry DNA's chip contains twice the number of clinically relevant SNPs. So the SNPs are the, the sequences that contain the, um, the single nucleotide um, polymorphism or change um, with some surrounding sequence. Um, both, both companies have about the, a similar number of total SNPs, but on Ancestry DNA's chip, they have um, more relevant SNPs. Okay. So um, just to, to let you know, um, I went to the 23andMe site and they're having a sale right now. <laughs> so until the end of the month, you could get $70 off from their health and ancestry kit. So um, it's a good time to, to um, consider doing it um, right now. So that's $70 off, I think about $199 for the two, the two tests together. Um, so it's something to consider. Okay, so um, that's what I have, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. So we do have some questions in the chat box. Awesome. Um, Should I stop share? Uh, sure. Okay. And if people have questions, um, they can raise their hand or unmute. But um, Lynn asked, she or she said, I was not clear about the AP, the O. I'm not sure it's she writes APE4 slash four, and I'm not sure if that might have been a typo, being 30 to 40 percent versus 91 percent as of 2017. Is there a citation? Uh, yes, um, I can provide that. It's um, it's a, a, a new analysis um, of like four major studies. So, you know, sometimes with the numbers, the, um, for one thing, um, APO 4.4s are kind of rare. And, and also there is a bias in DNA testing towards certain types of people. So, um, you know, basically people in, of Anglo-Saxon, um, Northern European ancestry are more likely to get tested. And so it's thought that that skews it. And also when you don't have enough people, it can be very hard to nail down the statistics. So um, so I think that that's constantly being re revised and updated. Um, but yeah, I can, I can provide that citation. Okay. You could email that to me and then I can include yeah. it in the recap. Another question was about whether or not, um, I, I think when you test and you find out you have the AP, the APO4, and I, I know I'm messing that pronunciation up, uh, should, should, you, <laughs> should you also have an MRI? Um, I think that for MRI, um, I, I don't know the value of doing that before one has any symptoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that for one thing, it would be challenging to get insurance to cover an MRI when you have no symptoms. Um, and so the, by getting your genotype, you can do whether you have symptoms or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm not sure, does that, would that answer the question you think? Yeah. Okay. Um, Rochelle asked, is it better to eat fish? then take fish oil supplements. And you did answer that question shortly after she asked it. Okay, okay. Um, since APOE4, oh, not, not efficient at supplying neurons with coal and lipids, cholesterol and lipids, do you mm -hmm. have suggestions for treatment? Yeah, I think that, um, for one thing, the, the cholesterol is being made on site in the brain. Um, it does not cross the blood brain barrier. So, um, but other lipids um, do cross the blood brain barrier. So you can supply um, 
you can make sure that your, your brain is supplied with those by eating healthy fats um, and make sure you have enough supply of that. Okay. Um, do we know why APOE4 is not a contributor to Alzheimer's for certain communities? You had mentioned African Americans, Hispanics Americans, and Native Americans. Yeah, I think it, it um, well, this is just conjecture, but um, I, you know, I think part of it is that um, there may be a ceiling effect so that many of these um, communities have um, higher uh, incidence of some of the lifestyle factors that contribute to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it could just be, you know, that that's as high as they're going to go. Um, it also could be the complement of genes that they carry. They may be carrying um, genes that are maybe more specific to their ethnic group that um, are interacting with E4. Now, it is known that the um, the source of the DNA around APOE4 influences the love, the expression of the APOE4 gene. So you know, presumably um, that is dictated by um, the um, factors such as the ethnicity of the parent you you inherited it from. Um, also, could be um, influenced by. Um, epigenetic changes based on some environmental factors that influenced um, that parent's expression of the gene. Um, so, you know, definitely the, it's probably a combination of genetics and epigenetics that are at play there. Mm -hmm. um, how do you view brain games like Brain HQ? Um, I think they're great. I think that, you know, um, there's, there's a good deal of of research behind, especially Brain HQ, um, they've done a lot to um, to show that their their brain games um, actually help uh, with cognitive impairment, and also that um, that they what would you call it? It's like cross train. So basically, the the particular brain brain game actually. Um, uh, causes improvements in other domains of brain activity. So it's not just because it's not just about overtraining one aspect of, of brain function uh, based on the game that you actually improve other areas. So I, I like them. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn asked if you are familiar with plasmalogens. Am I pronouncing that anywhere remotely correctly? Plasmalogens. There, um, there's new research out um, from um, a scientist a, who has been studying uh, plasmalogens and their impact. Um, oh, I haven't. Yeah, it's very exciting, and it's called the. His website is called P R O D R O M E. It's cost prohibitive, but there there's some lovely research. Uh, dang good I'm not remembering his last name it's d-a-e-n um, but he's done a lot of research in this area awesome great I'll look into that thank you especially with the glial with the combating microglial inflammation okay hmm. um if one sibling tests for apo apoe4 should others in a family test um, yes, I think that um, you don't necessarily have what they have, you know, so, <laughs> um, and it depends. I mean, if you, if you know exactly what the parents have, you could probably make that, um, get a clearer idea without actually getting tested. But, you know, the reality is, is that you don't actually know for yourself unless you get your own gene, genotype done. Okay. Um, and has any research been done with people who live in blue zones? Um, I believe those are areas where. Um, yeah. Um, overlapping. Uh, I think I'd say a little bit. Yes and no. I mean, I know that that for the Mediterraneans um, that actually 
the connection between ApoE4 and Alzheimer's risk is less in um, Mediterranean Europeans versus Northern Europeans. Um, also, some of the blue zones are thought to be more, um, I guess, perhaps be more Aboriginal in a sense, um, and that the the gene maybe behaves differently um, in that location versus if, um, for instance, people who have Western diets. There's that uh, there's this idea of the ApoE4 being kind of like a thrift gene, um, and that the problem really especially comes in uh, when it's combined with a um, with like a Western diet and Western lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> so if there's a thought that if people um, in some of these communities uh, where they have healthier living style and that they may or may not have ApoE4, but that may be the reason why the, connect, the risk is not as high with having ApoE4 until they actually move to the US. For instance, so the African-Americans there's, um, you know, there's not, there is a difference in terms of they have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's in the U.S., but um, people of in Af in Africa actually have a lower incidence, and it's thought to be reflective, perhaps, of the uh, the interaction between genes and Western lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, Susan asks, is there research about pickleball, and I'm not exactly sure um, whether... Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I do believe there's uh, there's research showing that exercise benefits people with ApoE4, and that's, you know... <laughs> it's that's a form a of exercise. exercise. Yeah, that's a form of exercise. Uh, and Lynn shared the link to Dane good um, oh, okay, awesome. so I'll include that. Um, and I, th that seems to be the end of our questions. Uh, anyone else have anything, any other thoughts? Um, I also shared the link to, um, a, not a good now, but another research article on plasmalogens and Alzheimer's disease, because it's a supplement that can be taken. Okay, I will include those that information in my email update uh, that I'll send out tomorrow with the link to the recording. Um, Dr. Spencer, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Uh, we truly appreciate it. It was really very interesting, very enlightening. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to stop our recording. Um,